I want to start out with a passage from the Shulchan Aruch. Everybody's familiar with what the Shulchan Aruch is? No. It's a book. Yeah, it's a book that tells you what to do. Did I hear a no? Did somebody say no? Well, anyway, the historically, one of the unique features of the Shulchan Aruch is that it's a, it was written by um, Yosef Karo, who was uh, a, a Sephardi. But someone came along by the name of Israelis, and he wrote some uh, glosses to the text. And what he did is put in some comments which showed the Ashkenazic customs or the Ashkenazic way of doing things. So when you put the Spartac and Ashkenazic customs <laughs> together, you get a book that everybody now holds the sacred saying, well, I shouldn't say everybody. Um, but a lot of people hold the sacred saying, and if you want to know what Judaism says about anything in a neat and orderly fashion, you go to the Shulchan Aruch. So in the Shulchan Aruch, um, there is one of these glosses that say, that says, some people take care not to eat nuts, since this is talking about Rosh Hashanah. Some people take care not to eat nuts, since the gematria for egos, which is the Hebrew for nut, is chet, or sin. Moreover, nuts cause a lot of phlegm and mucus, and spoils one's prayers. <laughs> there goes art. I love it. Well, I'll tell you. Give me a break. <laughs> Can't hear you, Art. I was just laughing because Ginny was laughing. I, I, I really. Right. I, I it makes perfect sense. Well, actually. <laughs> explains a lot. Uh, yeah. Actually. <laughs> We should all be laughing because what we're going to do now is um, uh, knock this uh, knock this piece out um, and show that uh, it's uh, in the words of one commentator here. It's rather flimsy. <laughs> was that flimsy Boy, or that's flimsy? That's polite. Uh, well. Let me put it this way. It's so cockamamie, and that's a good English word, that we can't even figure out what is the origin of this, of this custom, if in fact it really is a custom. I can uh, tell you what the reason is. The reason is because if you have an allergy to the nuts, and what happens is you can get the mucus in your mouth and in your throat and you can't speak and, and it bothers you. That's the reason somebody had an allergy who wrote that thing. <laughs> well, granted, I'll grant you that if somebody does have an allergy, that can happen. But to make it a general statement that it's a custom for everybody, not, for anybody not to do this is a little weak especially when they try to justify it with the gematria. Because if you look at the, if we want to really get into the gematria, the gematria of ego is not only um, equals the value of chet, which is sin, but it also equals the value of tov, which is good. So- Isn't, isn't justifying anything with gematria kind of flimsy? Well, just saying. <laughs> yeah, what we're going to do here, frankly, Art, is we're going to knock this whole thing to pieces. Um, and uh, I mean, there's even one source here that says um, if if we're going to go by the gematria of egos, well, let's find some um, some nuts that have different names 
and have a different gematria. Um, the part about it causing different reactions, I'll, I'll take Les's uh, explanation because it's as good as the one that I have. Um, yeah, somebody probably had an allergy and came up with it. Um, so this takes care yeah, isn't of. There uh, a, um, isn't that why in certain parts of Spain they 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 say f instead of instead of su? You know, like uh, Catalan, I think, or Castilian. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know that, why. Wasn't that because there was some some king or prince like back in the 12th century who had a lisp? And so everybody had to speak like that? Probably yeah. that's why no. <laughs> you say Thames for the river. Oh. Because some dumb king couldn't pronounce English. Uh, all right. I, I don't know about this, but let me just wrap this part up <laughs> since it's, uh, it, it struck such a great note here. Um, note anyway that all these sources in the Shulchan Aruch and in other places, which I skimmed over because you guys jumped right to the end, um, it's clear the custom did not orig originate from what these guys said. So we have to conclude that they were discussing a custom that was already in practice. And therefore, they, uh, they said, people take care. You know, in other words, it's already done. Not you should take care. But there are people who take care not to eat these nuts. And we, we also conclude that the reasons given in the Shulchan Aruch are really too insubstantial to, to base this custom. So it's most likely that someone had this custom and over the years, the reason why it came into being was forgotten and everybody struggled to find a reason to explain it, you know. But that leads, that really leads into what I want to talk about today. And that is, um, there are foods that we eat on Rosh Hashanah that have been customary uh, in many places um, and unknown in others. Um, have any of you ever been at a Rosh Hashanah Seder? Oh man, it struck cold. All right. Uh, the the um, the Rosh Hashanah Seder has really been um, popular among Svarti and Mizrahi Jews uh, for quite a while. Um, and actually, when I uh, looked up the origin, you know, I googled what are the origins of a Rosh Hashanah Seder, I found that the person most cited as the expert on where this uh, comes from and what it is, is Rachel Musliach, uh, which most of us know. That's, uh, for those of you who don't know her, that uh, Rabbi Musliach's daughter, um, she, uh, she writes for Hadassah magazine uh, she does Jewish tours to India and amongst other things that she does. And, um, but she is also, um, she put out a book a couple of years ago on, um, on, on Rosh Hashanah Seder and, uh, you know, lists some of the origins and customs. Now, there are other books that have come out and other Seders that have been published. Um, all following along similar lines, but as opposed to a Pesach Seder, there is no given format, or there's a format, but there is no uh, standard procedure that everyone follows. In other words, I'm going to go through, you know, uh, one Seder, 
and we'll see that there are a lot of different variations. So anyway, um, the origin of the Seder date back to the, actually to the Talmud, um, where Abaye discusses omens that carry significance and suggests that at the beginning of each new year, people should make a habit of eating the following foods. They grow in profusion and symbolize prosperity. Pumpkin, a bean-like vegetable called rubia, leeks, beets, and dates. Okay. Um, so she also says, it's difficult to trace how the ceremony evolved from that Talmudic mention to its current form. So what are, what are the sources of what we have to look to find them? Cookbooks. According to a cookbook called Sephardic Holiday Cooking, it is told that when the Babylonian scholar Hai Gaon left the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, his students would bring him a basket filled with different fruits over which he recited various blessings and biblical verses. The Baghdadi rabbi Chacham Yosef Chaim mentions this ceremony in his compilation of Jewish law and practice. So, okay. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Let me get it first of all so I can see you guys and then we'll talk about this a little more. Okay. Um, this is a, uh, just one, one uh, guide that I found. And I use this one because it was the simplest to, uh, to copy and put together so I could show it to you. Uh, it says that the, before Rosh Hashanah gather the following items, dates, light colored beans, leeks, beets, a gourd, pomegranate, apple, and the head of a ram or a fish. Okay, anybody want to go out and get a ram? Uh, I want the horns if you do. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I would dare say that at least um, I would rather guess that uh, the head of a fish is a more common practice. <laughs> you know, this, so this Seder is usually conducted uh, at dinner uh, on the first night of Rosh Hashanah. Although some people go for uh, for doing it both nights, um, and we start out in usual fa fashion with kiddish making mozi, and then we turn to um, to the you know the actual seder, and the seder consists of taking these various um, items, you know, they're, I guess, fruits and vegetables, and reciting a little passage. Uh, some of them we recite the bracha for them, uh, but for on all of them we, we recite a passage. It starts with the formula, Yehira Tzol Milfanecha Arnayel Ahinu Gelhe Abotenu. May your, be your will, Lord our God and God of our fathers. And, or you can add mothers, if you will. Um, this coming from an Orthodox source did not have there. Um, and then a phrase that relates to the item. And there's usually a play on, on words here. For example, if we take the date, you see here the word, we take date and it's word related to the word tam, to win. So you can see tam, uh, tamar starts uh, taf mem, which is 
to end. And the sentence that we recite is Shayitamu Oivenu Vasonenu Komavakshe Ratenu. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, it says, may it be your will, etc., that there come an end to our enemies, haters, and those who wish evil upon us. So taking the word for dates, we get uh, Tamar or Tam Yishayi Tamu. All right, and that's our pattern. In the case of, ta of, of dates, uh, it's also proper to say the Bore Pri Hait. Okay, the next one is beans, rubia, or uh, luvia, many, or heart. Again, saying the bracha bore priha dama. Um, and then we have the hirat zone, sher yirbu zichiyotenu ut. It's too small, I can't see what it says here. Ut labenu. Now, um, I should also point out that the Seder that, that we follow, that Carmi and I follow, um, which we were given by a, uh, a friend of ours who's not Savardi. She actually is a, uh, I think, a 10th generation Yerushalmi. Uh, which means that, you know, her, her family, uh, you know, has been living in Jer Jerusalem. Um, I guess we now say her children and her siblings' grandchildren are now the, what, 11th and 12th generations of people who are living in Jerusalem. Um, but anyway, she, her, her version is a little bit different. Um, so that's why I've never seen this Ut Lab Labvenu. But anyway, it's your marriage, our marriage shall increase that you hearten us. Um, okay. Um, are we okay with all this so far? So now we take a week. Uh, and it's related to the word Karate to cut, and we come up with the sage Sheyikar to of Oivenu Vasonenu Komavakshe Ratenu. Then our enemies, haters, and those who wish evil upon us shall be cut down. Wait a minute. Yeah, here, here before it was the that who wish evil upon us, now we're cutting them down. Okay, silka is beets, and it's related to the word salak, to depart, and it's sheyitalku oivenu v'sonenu koma bakshe ra'atenu. Then our enemies, haters, and those who wish evil upon us shall depart. Okay, uh, the gourd is kara, to rip apart. Also comes from the same word to announce, but that the evil of our verdict shall be ripped and our merits be announced before you. Ramon is mitzvot karimon. May we be filled with mitzvot like a pomegranate that it had, that is filled with seeds. There is a um, another custom regarding pomegranates. Um, anybody want to guess how many seeds are in a uh, typical pomegranate? Six hundred and thirteen. <laughs> what do you got? Six hundred thirteen. <laughs> Um, well, the actual the actual tradition is that there are three hundred and sixty-five. 
So, so there, there are a lot of people who go along with this custom here and say that if everybody eats a whole pomegranate, you're going to have a sweet year for the whole year. Uh, we actually once tried to count the number of seeds in a pomegranate. The problem is some of them were, were uh, bruised or otherwise damaged and we couldn't get an accurate count, but we came pretty close. Uh, you know, it was well, over 350, so we were pretty close there. Okay, now we have our um, well-known apples and honey, um, dipping the apple in the honey, uh, and the usual phrase, Shetakadeh Shalenu Shana Tova Mutuka, that we should be renewed for a, a good and sweet year. And here we come to the, to the ram's head. Um, and it says, I love this one, Shaniya the Rosh below the Zanav, that we should be like the head and not the tail. Okay. Um, and where they also add, and you shall remember for us the binding and the ram of our forefather Isaac, the son of our forefather, forefather Abraham, you know, peace be unto him. Okay. So this is a Seder. Um, by the way, um, if anyone is so inclined to have a copy of that, I did put it in the chat. You know, the file is in the chat. Um, the, um, it could be said that whereas in most of our holidays, we find some type of foods that we eat that are special to the day, to the except for Yom Kippur, of course. Um, you know, and um, like on Shavuot, we have dairy foods. You know, Pesach doesn't need explanation. Uh, Pesach has hamantashen, etc. So, in one way. You know, as I mentioned, some of the sources of, of these customs of not eating or, or eating or this Seder or other things are, are kind of obscure. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it does give us something that really is another way to make the day special. Um, in the years that we've been doing it, we always find that it does add, add to the idea of this is really a festive occasion. Um, you know, and we're not just sitting down, you know, going through um, Kiddush and Motzi and the other things that we do, especially say on Arab Shabbat and, and makes Rosh Hashanah a, a, a little bit, um, you know, more, a little bit more festive, shall I say. And, um, and, uh, you know, I encourage you if you want to do anything. Besides, uh, there are um, different ways to do some of these uh, foods, uh, you know, not just eating them straight. Uh, like, um, and there are different foods that you can add. Um, we have found uh, spinach pancakes are good. I think we do that instead of the leeks. Um, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, and uh, there are there are sources that you can find online, um, cookbooks, actual uh, seders to follow. Some get more elaborate than this. There, as I say, there is there is no fixed pattern. There is no fixed um, pattern of even which foods to include or not include. Um, and um, I just encourage you to go for it. You know, is this? Uh, this Mort? Yeah, I was just going to say yeah, I, too, I, too tame. Nobody's asking questions. But go ahead, Doug. Well, I I, I think there's a real opportunity to popularize 
uh, the, the Rosh Hashanah Seder, especially among younger people, uh, by referencing the first of the special foods and calling it instead date night. Okay. Um, the, uh, what's the name of uh, the, uh, the youth advisor? Uh, what's your name? Rachel? Is that her name, Rachel? You know, uh, we'll, we'll send her that, that part of the, uh, the, the recording so she can add it to the... Uh, yeah, her name is Rachel. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I was going to say this is... Uh, Wait, hold on one second. Did I forget anything? Another thing you can do, or I, I, I tend to do in these situations with people, because right, holidays bring together people of different levels of observance too, and different levels of engagement, um, is, um, is invite people to also to suggest foods that for them have symbolic value um, and also kind of make up symbolic etymologies. And I know that goes outside of, of I mean, so, so at least like my family this year, we're bringing in traditional foods right with these derivations, but it also gives people a chance to have less traditional comfort levels to, right, to bring in their own ideas and right, a lot like Pesach, right? So I, that's a good idea. I, I like that. I like what you're saying. Um, as you're saying that, I remember that, well, there's the other custom that we have too, of, of eating some kind of fruit that is new to us, either, you know, especially for the year or a fruit that we've never eaten. And there was uh, one year where um, I, uh, I was uh, up in uh, Rochester, New York to, uh, to do uh, one of the services at the hill out there for Rosh Hashanah. And um, the Chabad rabbi up there invited me to his house for, uh, for dinner on uh, Erev Rosh Hashanah. And he, he went to the supermarket, you know, he went to Whole Foods or <clears throat> some place where they have, you know, the, uh, the produce museum uh, to find the fruit that uh, he thought would be uh, appropriate as a new fruit for everybody. And um, I think it was ugly fruit. Anybody ever had an ugly fruit? I've what'd never you, eaten What did you think of it? It was good. Uh, well, the one he got wasn't good. <laughs> it was actually horrible. Um, and since, and since we all had done a, you know, the, uh, the blessing for the new fruit and, you know, for everything that he put with it, we all had to be polite and, uh, and take a bite from it. Um, but, uh, it, it didn't go over too well. I think it was ugly. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was uh, one of those other, you know, tropical fruits. But uh, I just remember it being something that was being horrible. <laughs> uh, everybody's being too quiet today. Okay, I'll say something. <laughs> isn't there? Isn't there a um, maybe saying danger overstates it, but. Isn't there a potential for um, for some confusion over what constitutes um, a, a genuine religious belief or practice and what constitutes some symbol or superstition? Flimsy, some flimsy excuse. Okay. Yes. Um, what would be your response? Well, I'm asking the question, so obviously I think there is. I think that, uh, you know, someone who doesn't, who, who is not as, uh, you know, conversant with, with Judaism as, as we are, you know, might, might come in and, you know, re read a prayer and think, okay, this is, what, this is what Jews believe, 
and then we, you know, we have some, uh, you know, uh, have a date because uh, because of the gamatria, because of some belief in uh, or it's some symbol. Uh, you know, how do you sort those out? How do you say this is this is real? This is a if to, to to quote a term, a religious fact. Um, I love that term, a religious fact. And something else is simply, a, you know, a nice sort of a, a friendly little symbol that doesn't really mean much outside of outside of the uh, the ceremony in which it's used. Right. Is it is it possible that there is um, another parameter to evaluate these on rather than the legitimacy no. of it? No, it's not possible. Okay, so I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, what 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 this does is um, reinforces uh, the concept of of mindfulness or intentionality, where we're taking something that may may be viewed as trivial. I mean, you're making fun of it because it seems trivial, um, and and finding meaning in that and relevance, and. I, that seems to me to be a, a, a very positive re religious value. Isn't it kind of a free for all though, if everybody is, is coming up with his or her own, own meaning if, for everything? If, well, but that's not what they're doing. They're trying, to, they're trying to tie it back to something that you can reference. And I mean, if you're seeing, actually what they're trying to do is find the holiness in virtually anything that you do, no matter how trivial seeming. I mean, I, I don't know if this is helpful, but but at least at least for with people, I mean, I I at least I give framing right. So so just just a little bit of frame, a little bit of con context, so that um, right. So that I don't know. At, le at least there's right there's some understanding of, of exactly like right. That's kind of the project of finding. Of finding meaning, and this is what we're doing. Um, but, but at least there's a little bit of awareness that right, this is kind of a creative endeavor that we're doing something to um, to try to find connection and utility. But that it, but but also, but there's conscientiousness that it doesn't it doesn't have the same status as other types of ritual. But that's not in that moment. Um, that's also not the overriding concern, um, but I think you can do both. Okay, All right. I, I, I have uh, several different, uh, I, I think I'm going to come up with three different types of answers. Um, the first is I think that if you look at any religious practice um, in any religious tradition, and you're going to find some customs and rituals that will seem unusual. Uh, I guess the word for the day is flimsy or, um, or just weird. Um, we can even start off, you know, why do we take those leather straps and, and torture ourselves with them every morning? Um, you know, and I, I say this in a way of when an outsider will look at something, there's a lot of things that people do that look strange. But to the people who are doing it, it's very meaningful. And it, and it derives that meaningfulness from the, um, right now for the lack of a, of a better word, from the peoplehood to which they belong. In other words, um, we have our practices because we know that down through the years, these are practices that have come to us, you know, from our parents, our previous generations, from our congregation, from our community, uh, wherever we want to look. Um, and we can say we can distinguish some practices by you know, the thing that we've been talking about for the last couple of months, um, you know, when we looked at those who say everything was uh, Moshe, you know, Moshe Messini, um, or 
rabbinic interpretation through the years. Um, and those seem to have more standing, more uh, permanence in what we do. Um, on the other hand, we now have, I think what Sherry's alluding to, I think there's a more common practice, or it seems to us there's a common practice nowadays of more creativity, um, more people uh, being able to come up with uh, different rituals and different practices. Uh, there's even a, a website um, that uh, is called Ritual Well. Uh, it's administrated out of the uh, Reconstructionist Rabbinical School, where people who are coming up with new rituals can post them for other people to share. Um, but, but I think if we look back at the, some of these other rituals that, like the, Pesach, like the Rosh Hashanah Seder we've just been talking about, where everybody admits the origins are vague, but yet it has attained a certain acceptance within the community. And I think that's the big thing here. <laughs> I come up, as a matter of fact, I did come up with my own ritual and I posted it on Ritual Well. Um, you know, when I have uh, my mother's yard site, which is also the anniversary of my transplant, um, I have a ritual of also remembering uh, my donor. Um, that's just an aside for now. But anyway, um, we can come up with different practices. And the whole key, I think, is who agrees with you? Uh, if, anybody, if anybody says, oh, hey, that's really nice. I like what you're doing. I'm going to copy it. Boom, we've got a tradition started. Um, some take, some don't. Uh, what comes to mind is that if you remember um, Rabbi Stone, it's got to be 20 years ago, maybe more, came up with the idea of um, an all-night vigil for Yom HaShoah, uh, where people were he stayed up all night in, in the in shul and he and had different readings different things for people to uh, meditate on if it, to use that word and um there's not a other than just being there uh nothing more uh, elaborate um and he did it i think from two i don't even think we got to the third year and I asked him once, why did he stop doing it? He said, nobody picked up on it. Um, it didn't go anyplace. I thought it was a decent idea, but it didn't go anyplace and we lost that ritual. Um, but on the other hand, um, on the other hand, uh, there are other rituals that have taken on. Go ahead, Natalie. I think it's great what Sherry posted in the chat about the Swedish fish. And any way that we can engage kids, engages parents, engages grandparents to get them involved. And, or even with myself, like I've never done a Rosh Hashanah Seder. And, you know, I don't eat Swedish fish, but I like the whole idea of it. And to just get maybe a couple people together social distancing i really like this and you know that's another piece of it that we're not alone that we're together and celebrating a oneness that you know we all share something significant and what's significant to me may not be significant to someone else and you know as long as we're respectful of that and realize that this is what we're doing to you know nourish our souls or whatever we want to do i think it's wonderful mm -hmm. i i think it because of it, uh, if it's vagueness, it's a wonderful, you know, Seder to do. You know, it would be fun. Maybe next year. I want to add one other thing to Art's question. Okay. Because I think the last part of, I think, what uh, answers your question is, I think, one of the best things and also the worst thing. 
And in one word, the internet. I guess that's two. We have to add the internet. In other words, oh. uh, you know, when I Googled Rosh Hashanah Seder uh, last night, uh, there's tons of stuff, tons of stuff out there. So on one hand, the internet is probably the best way to promulgate these type of things, but it's also the best way of promulgating things that shouldn't be promulgated. Um, and it gets to the point of you know, we have to know the sources and we have to know, uh, and we have to look and see how it affects us. Um, and that I think I have to come down to that that's going to be the answer. How do I determine it? Because I could say, hey, this makes sense. No, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't like that. Uh, I think, Natalie, you want to say something? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if we have time this year, but I may do it privately with a couple of people. But it would be fun to do this online. Does it have to be right before Rosh Hashanah? It is going to be done online. Yes. That's what I was going to say. Yosef and Annie are doing it as part of the Erev Rosh Hashanah service. Oh. At 6.30 p.m. on Friday evening. At 6 p.m., the Church of the Holy Trinity is ringing their bells with, um, with, with songs from Rosh Hashanah. And then at 6.30, there, Annie and Yosef are hosting a short Myru followed by um, a Seder. Seder. Um, and, and I believe the option, there'll be an option to break into small groups afterwards for, for a meal. Lovely. Yeah, I remember reading that on your, on the econ. I completely forgot about it. Yeah. So yeah. I it's, look into that. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder, David. Um, so you yeah, look into that? You know, it's, uh, I, I encourage it. I think it's, uh, it's fun. Uh, you get to eat some things that you may not be, uh, be eating at an uh, unusual time. And, uh, and thanks, Jerry. Yay for the nut allergy that made me think of talking about this. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I know it's early, but I'll conclude by, first of all, wishing everyone a Shana Tova Ubriyahu Mutuka. You know, especially um, the Briah. You know, so, you know, everybody have a sweet, healthy, and safe year. Um, and, um, you know, I have, a, have a nice Seder and uh, pay attention to all those emails that David sends out because <laughs> It has all the schedule, schedule of uh, what we're going to be doing, and uh, um, I know I'm going to have to say after a two-day yontif, we'll see if uh, we come up with anything to talk about next Monday. Uh, we'll give it a shot, but I'm not promising anything. Obviously, the Monday after that, we will not be getting together. Uh, or we will be getting together, but, together, not, but not for this. But not in this format. So uh, you can analyze how the services went in accordance with the teshuva about electronic uh, uh, service. <laughs> so uh, it could be our post Rosh Hashanah. Topic. No, no uh, pressure, David. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, right. So, I, I included a Haggadah for uh, the service um, in the chat box if you want to download it. I just I just put in not not trying just just another source which is not as sophisticated as the RA source but um I was looking I have a three year old nephew <laughs> um so I was looking at the PJ Library site and it had a very lovely illustrated symbolic foods um, um, with explanations and brachot um, which is that that was also just it, it surprised it surprised me actually how how just how nice it was it was and actually suitable for adults too. Um, Some of the stuff PJ Library does is actually very good. Yeah. So they just uh, they they just go for uh, 
middle of the road stuff. So, okay. All right, Joshua. Joshua. Okay. Yeah, Joshua. Mark, happy, healthy New Year to everybody. Yeah, same. Uh, yeah. Next week is Tom Gedalia. That's right. You look That's quite right. everybody. Just remember, if the situation was reversed, was Gedalia fast for you? <laughs> <laughs> I love your favorite. David, did you put that online, that, that ah. 30 thing next Friday? It's Friday? Um, yes. The, you can go to the BZBI website. And if you look under worship, uh, the high holiday schedule is, is listed there. I'll be sending out an email uh, just after noon today with the full schedule as well. Thank you. Great. Uh, 6.30 thing on Friday? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and on Tuesday, tomorrow, I'll be sending out the, the links to everyone um, okay. with, the, with the special uh, unique codes for, for all of the services. Okay. And can you put that Seder... Uh, uh, thing in the that you put on uh, the chat. I don't know how to take it out of the chat box. You uh, just click it. Just click on it now. It will. It will come out of it. Yeah, and, and I, I can't guarantee that they'll use that that Seder book, but um, but it's very good. It's 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 got some good things in it. Yeah, the Seder book. Okay. Uh, all right, everybody. Shana Tova. Shana Tova, everybody. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shikoa, Mort. Shikoa. 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 Shikoa.